Breitling bought the Universal Geneve brand. That's huge news. Universal Geneve had been on sale for a very long time, but the price was always considered exorbitant. But the holding company that had the brand found the offer from Breitling compelling. $70 million, I think. And now the question on everybody's lips is, what will Breitling do with Universal Geneve? Let's dive in. I'm going to spare you the detailed long and winding history of Universal Geneve. There are tons of articles and videos out there. The short version is this. Universal Geneve were around for a long time, and if they were and are praised for two things, it's the pole router, a Gerald Genta designed dress watch, and they were a chronograph brand. They have the wildest, most stunning back catalog of chronographs. They've got designs like the Nina Rent, Compax, Bicompax, Tricompax, all sorts. The key is good looking, wearable, classic chronographs that were technologically quite impressive. Then they got hit hard by the quartz crisis and all sorts of bad things happened and they didn't die, but they definitely languished in the hands of a holding company that did nothing with them for decades, essentially. Currently, Breitling is held by a mixture of private equity firms with CBC and Partners Group, a Swiss PE firm holding the major stakes in the company. In a super simplified version, private equity companies buy other companies, fix them and sell them for a profit. PE firms look for companies that they believe have potential and are currently viewed as undervalued. When you buy, you very rarely have the cash to buy a company outright. PE almost always makes use of some sort of leveraged buyout. They loan money. Often they loan money with the purchased company's assets as collateral. Think of it as a third or fourth mortgage on your house. It gets you the money, but there's a debt that has to be paid. Often the PE firm will leverage the debt so they pay little upfront and try to get out of the deal before the majority of the debt has to be repaid. This usually means that most PE firms want to get out of ownership in less than seven years-ish. Ideally faster. Those of you paying attention will know that Breitling has been owned by private equity since 2017. That's basically seven years as of 2024, but by all accounts, the goal is to go public in 2027, so a total of 10 years. But Breitling has actually changed hands. This year, or was it in 2022, CVC relinquished its majority stake in Breitling to Partners Group, essentially selling some of their stake to the other PE firm. This happens often with PE firms moving assets between themselves and often refinancing along the way, partially resetting the clock. The goal is always to exit, and there are two ways to do that. You can sell it to an industry entity, so sell Breitling to Swatch or Richemont or LVMH or Rolex, or you go public. In the case of Breitling, the odds of Swatch or Richemont having the kind of cash that the firms want for Breitling are very small. What you usually end up paying is some multiple of either the revenue generated or the profit the company generates. So an EBIT multiple or something similar. The multiple depends on the future potential of the business, the market you're in, and a lot of other factors. Again, this is super simplified, but you get the gist. So the only realistic option is going public and hoping the IPO recoups the debt the costs incurred while owning the company and nets them an overall profit on top. Which brings us to the price. How do you sell or go public and make a profit? Well, like I said, by fixing the company you bought. There's a reason I say fixing in inverted commas. The key goal of private equity is not to fix a company. The goal of private equity ownership is to increase the value of the company or rather the perceived value and make a profit on that increase in value. If that entails fixing, they'll fix, but it's not necessarily a requirement, but rather a potential consequence. There are a ton of books about private equity out there. Some focus on all the negatives of private equity. Others focus on the strengths of private equity. I suggest you read books from both sides. Anyway, you buy something or 1 billion and you do stuff that convinces people that is now worth 5 billion. There's basically three ways you can convince people of that. You demonstrate growth, more revenue, the growth doesn't necessarily have to be profitable, but putting a company in a position where it's making a lot more top line than before grows the value. Two, you cut costs. You look at a company that's using 5,000 people to do what competitors are using 1,000 people to do. So you bring down that headcount to 1,000 people, and now you're more valuable because you're essentially doing the same thing you did before, just more efficiently. You can also do it by outsourcing and focusing. For example, stopping making movements and sourcing those instead and focusing entirely on cases and dials. It reduces complexity and therefore cost. Three, you bolt on assets. So you buy other companies that overall make the entire entity appear more valuable. There's a downside to all those three things though. 
One, you want revenue, but you want short-term revenue increase because you have that seven-year-ish window. As such, long-term sustainable revenue is not necessarily the goal. It might be a byproduct, but you want to pump the numbers now. This essentially means pumping out the hits instead of innovating and trying new things. You play it safe and you pump out what sells now. Two, when you cut costs aggressively, over time processes potentially deteriorate. Quality drops, errors increase, and long-term problems start to develop. This is not a case where these costs are cut once new procedures have been put in place. You potentially also lose know-how. You cut the costs first and leave the fixing of the processes to a later date. When it comes to bolt-on assets, it's sometimes more important to have the assets that you bolt on rather than actually doing something with them. You have to do a little bit to demonstrate the potential, but the major investment in really making those bolt-on purchases long-term viable is not done by the private equity firm. They will usually do a few proof of concepts showing the market that there is potential, but essentially leave the main investment to the future owners. And that's all because there's one thing you very rarely do, and that is invest in the long-term. Any sort of capital expenditure, so any invention, any new technology that doesn't have a payback time of you know, less than seven years is not going to get prioritized. If it takes five years to develop a new movement and five years to turn a profit on that movement, it's not getting developed. Breitling was a prime candidate for takeover by private equity. Before 2016, Breitling was a bit of a mess in many ways. Breitling had a ton of references in multiple ranges. Not only that, but their prices also spanned a huge range from relatively speaking affordable watches to not necessarily Patek white gold ultra complication level pricing, but at least, you know, hugely expensive watches. They also had the problem that more than 50% of their watches were over 44 millimeters in size in a market where 60% of all watches sold were between 43 and 38 millimeters. Add to that that their watches were ugly in the eyes of the emerging new watch buyer. After a lot of years where big, shiny, garish watches like the Breitling for Bentley were popular, people were going for more restrained, simple, uncomplicated designs. 2017 was after all around the time where watches like the Tudor Black Bays started to become more popular. Smaller, simpler, cleaner. The Watch Muse has an excellent write-up of what Breitling and George Kern ended up doing that I recommend that you read, so I won't go in depth here. But the key is that all the problems that Breitling had were ideal private equity fodder. The watch market was gearing up to explode. There was a ton of potential. Remember 2016, 2015 was the year the Ceramic Daytona was released. Breitling was an underperforming household name. Breitling didn't have to invest in new technologies that cost a huge amount of money. Breitling didn't have to come up from scratch with new designs. All a new CEO had to do was cut the stuff that didn't sell, make the watches that did sell smaller, and then lean into a relatively strong back catalog of watches that historically had been quite popular. Basically, it was just a question of improving the focus of Breitling on a clear line and a clear demographic. And they likely also cut some costs. It's a difficult job, but it's not a complicated job. And in another private equity playbook tactic, they haven't really invested massively in new technology. The Breitling B01 chronograph movement was first released in 2009, and it's pretty much still a staple of Breitling's line. The new movements that Breitling do have are largely not developed in-house, but rather collaborations with Tudor's Kinesi brand, which keeps Breitling clean of expensive capital expenditures while still supplying them with up-to-date movements. The next piece of the puzzle is what Breitling bought, and this is key. Breitling basically bought a brand and some intellectual property. There is no state-of-the-art modern production facility. There are few to no new movements, innovations, and SKUs that are worth leveraging. All they get is a name and a back catalog of watches and relatively old movements. This is where I remind you of the key points to private equity ownership, and specifically this ownership. They seemingly want to go public in 2027. They want to maximize the value of the firm as per that date, but they do not want to invest in anything that does not provide a return on investment before that date. Technically, they have to do a little because investors want to see that something has happened and they haven't just wasted time, but they don't need to realize the full potential of the acquisition. There will, of course, be a time after private equity where Breitling will live on and have to capitalize on the strength and position they have been put in under private equity ownership. But that horizon is important to those PE owners, and there's no doubt that they are guiding Mr. Kern and company very, very closely. For Universal Geneve, that likely means a couple of things. 
I don't see massively available newly designed manual chronograph movements launched. They might do a GPHG piece unique or a limited run of a few watches to create hype, but the kind of money that goes into not only developing a movement, testing it and scaling production to mass produce it is not going to be feasible in a three year time frame. The movements are going to be key though, and it's going to be the key strategic challenge in the short term. The easiest thing to do is use the Universal Geneve designs and throw in a Breitling or a Kinesi movement. The problem with that is that it may look like a cash grab, especially as I'll get to in a moment, Breitling will want to price UG higher than Breitling. If they go towards designing movements from scratch or completely updating classic movements to modern specs, the disadvantage there is that it's a massive investment up front, something the PE firms will have a tough time with. Movements take a long time to develop. Consider that Breitling have been using the BO1 since 2009. Thierry Stern at one point said building a new watch with a new movement took four years for a basic movement. Breitling has three years to hire people, scale production and develop a movement. I don't see all of that happening. Scaling is also difficult. Basically, they have to find some middle ground where the initial movements are distinctly better than the Breitling movements, but not so new and groundbreaking that the return on investment is way past the PE firm's expected sell date. In general, I would find it highly unlikely that they'll invest massively in completely new movements from day one because of the costs connected to it. The most likely scenario is leveraging existing Breitling movements, a reworked B01 or B15, the Retro Punta manual wind movement, and fitting them to a modern, updated reinterpretation of the classic Universal Geneve models. You update the specs, you upgrade the finishing significantly. How about taking old UG movements and updating them to modern day specs? I'm, I'm unclear as to how straightforward or hard that is to do. My guess is that it's a bigger investment than the PE firms are willing to throw at it in the short term. I could see them staggering launches where they focus on watches with, let's call them, heavily improved Breitling movements. Then I can see them teasing that a new movement is in the works with the goal over the long term to have different levels of UG movements. So you would have entry with highly upgraded Breitling movements and then above that higher end UG enthusiast movements. There will not be a lot of watches in the first release. And again, the reasoning behind this is linked to the ownership model. Breitling has essentially had seven years so far to grow their revenue substantially. That revenue growth is in part what is going to drive the future valuation of Breitling when they eventually go public. The downside to a revenue valuation is that it's based heavily on past performance and a realistic assessment that the more you grow, the harder it is to grow more. Doubling your revenue is easy when you have a strong brand that's a mess, but once you get your act together, those initial growth gains taper off and end up more or less following the rest of the market. Think of Apple and the iPhone. In the beginning, when they were launched, they grew massively, but now everybody's kind of got an iPhone and revenue is more or less stable. So there's not a lot of potential left most of the potential is baked into the existing revenue. Universal Geneve bakes something else into the valuation, and that is future potential. The goal won't be in the next three years to get UG to a huge revenue. What Breitling will want to demonstrate prior to going public is that there is a huge untapped future revenue potential in that UG brand. Now, how do you do that? Well, you don't do it by producing 50,000 watches or even 20,000 on top of Breitling's 200,000-ish watch sales. No, you do it by doing a number of limited releases that over time are slightly bigger each time with the goal of selling out of your limited run. You want the investors to believe that when you one day don't do a limited run, you can sell three, four, five, ten times the number of watches. You want the watch community to be the driver of the initial hype the indicator of future potential. For the same reason, you likely don't launch with the best or the worst UG design. The Nina Rint is not going to be the first model out of the gate in mass production. That's the big gun in my mind. It's going to be something that will resonate with the public. So I don't necessarily think a pole router either, but a basic compact style chrono, just not the Nina Rint. Then comes the price point. It doesn't matter what price range UGs originally were in. This brand is going to be positioned relative to Breitling and it's going to be an upgrade to Breitling in terms of quality, perception and pricing. 
I don't think it's gonna be Patek levels for a lot of reasons. The level of hand finishing, movement detailing, and expensive materials needed to go Patek or AP level are just not realistic. Both because of what UG historically was, but also because it's too big a jump for Breitling. And it's too much of an investment in hiring and technology. So what's the price? A Breitling Premier B09 Chronograph manual wind goes for just under $10,000. A Universal Geneve Basic Chronograph? I'd price them here at $14,000, around the price of a Daytona, or more importantly, a Gigi Le Coulter Polaris Chrono. That's my gut feeling. Put their entry chronographs without additional complications price-wise near JLC. It's high-end, and they would have to put some extra work into the movements in terms of finishing, but it wouldn't require the kind of man hours that goes into a Lange, a Patek, or an AP. You put your brand on par with a relatively niche powerhouse like JLC or Glasshutter Original, depending on your ability to spiff up the movement, the case, and the dial finishing. That's where I'd put my money. Don't expect more than one or two Universal Geneve boutiques initially. The first watches are being sold to John Mayer, Ed Sheeran, and other rich enthusiasts, and they are being sold in a face-to-face -face meeting, not over a counter, and definitely not online. Depending on the scale, George Kern or whoever becomes CEO of UG will hand deliver those watches. Over time, that'll change, but buying expensive real estate and making massive investments in a large network is not the first problem Kern and Breitling need to solve. These watches will, if well-produced and well-marketed, sell themselves. In short, conservative release plan to build hype, prove to the market that there is future potential, try and keep investments in movements to a minimum initially, but you can't ignore it. UG's success rests on the movements as much as the designs. Place yourself as the upgrade from Breitling and establish yourself in the highly profitable and desirable, let's call it low end of the high end. But there's one more consideration. Let's just stick with the assumption that Breitling wants to go public in late 2027. If you want Universal Geneve to make an impact on that initial offering, they need to have launched something and not just one small thing. Ideally, they launch something late 2026 with a buildup throughout 2027. There's a lot of assumptions in all of this, but intuitively, a Universal Geneve that has gone live will add more value than a UG that has demonstrated nothing. Sticking with those assumptions, they have 2024, 2025, and some of 2026 to come up with some watches, some movements, a marketing plan, and some level of production. You can do that if you want to source everything in China, but that's not the route they're going. We all know that. But they also have to build Universal Geneva as a company. UG is a shell. It's a brand and some intellectual property. Imagine basically a room with a desk and a pile of paper filled with drawings on that desk. That's all they're buying. I strongly doubt that the people that come with the purchase are going to add any kind of skill or value to the future of UG. So Breitling has to shift internal resources from Breitling or hire some people externally to set up UG. Maybe convince Reshep Reshepi to become new head of design. You know, just spitballing, but imagine them bringing in some creative big gun to oversee the creative launch. Going from nothing in terms of skill and manpower to a finished product at the quality levels we're gaming out here in two and a half years is going to be ridiculously tight. You need to get a design team started, a marketing team, a movement team, a management team, and a team tasked with scaling production. Again, you can do a half-assed cash grab in two and a half years, but coming up with something that blows the socks off of the market is going to be ridiculously hard in that time frame. It's not impossible, but there's a very real business risk that the PE firm's dream of UG being so far along in the hands of Breitling that it can meaningfully impact that initial IPO is just not realistic. The people working on this will be under massive pressure. That could lead to them cutting corners to hit the deadline or to delays. I would go for the delay because if they botch this relaunch, it's going to be hard to fix it. So there's that consideration as well. I think that the acquisition of UG by Breitling makes excellent business sense. UG positioned as the upper tier of brands in Breitling's portfolio is the right way to go. The money is in the high end and the competition at the price points of Longines, Tudor and Seiko is just too tough. UG also has a cult following that could potentially drive massive attention in and outside the community. The money initially will be in the community, but over time, just like Breitling, it will be the high-end non-enthusiast that drives the revenue growth. In the next three years, we'll have the joy of seeing a very few number of classic Universal Geneva reinterpretations be released, but very, very few of us will likely get our hands on them. They will 
if Breitling does their job well, be massively desirable. And of course, in limited supply. I'm hoping they can get it done in two and a half years, but it's not guaranteed at all. It's going to be a ridiculously tight deadline. And then there's the time after Breitling inevitably goes public. What then? Well, that's when the fun can really begin. Investments in movements, increased production levels, and cool chronograph alternatives to the Polaris, the Speedy, the Daytona, and the Chronomaster Sport, but just way more expensive. We're going to have to be patient, but I think this is a good thing. At least I think so. Now, I've speculated enough. It's your turn. What do you think about the acquisition and what are you hoping for? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.